Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for tonight is the effect of zonulin and food sensitivities on gut health. My name is Christopher Chu. I am the Director of Marketing for Avexia Diagnostics and will be your host for this evening. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming back an outstanding guest, Dr. Robert G. Silverman, who will be our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Silverman is a chiropractic doctor, clinical nutritionist, national and international speaker, author of Amazon's number one bestseller, Inside Out Health, founder and CEO of Westchester Integrative Health Center. He graduated magna cum laude from the University of Bridgeport College of Chiropractic and has a master's of science in human nutrition. The ACA Sports Council named Dr. Silverman Sports Chiropractor of the Year in 2015. Dr. Silverman is on the advisory board for the Functional Medicine University and is a seasoned health and wellness expert on both the speaking circuits and the media. Dr. Silverman is a thought leader in his field and practice. In addition, he is a frequently published author in peer-reviewed journals and other mainstream publications. Joining Dr. Silverman tonight will be Dr. Wayne Sedano, our Director of Clinical Support and Education at Avexia Diagnostics. Additionally, Dr. Sedano is the Director of Integrative Medicine Education for the College of Integrative Medicine and lectures and teaches internationally. In addition, we are also joined by KBMO Diagnostics Chief Executive Officer, James White, and the and Avexia Diagnostics Director of Clinical or, 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 I apologize, Client Relations, Joanne Iverson. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. We encourage participation. So if you have a question, you may submit your questions in the questions field in the right-hand area of the interface. We will answer the submitted questions towards the end of the presentation. If your questions are not answered this evening, you will surely receive an answer by email within a day or two. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to James White. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chris, for, uh, for those kind words. Uh, and again, I'm excited to kind of pass you on to Dr. Robin. It's great to have um, Dr. Sedano on as well in terms of kind of ask, answer any kind of clinical questions. As some of you are aware, um, KBMO is the only patented test on the market uh, in terms of looking at a multiple pathway approach of not only the IgG, but also our complement. Uh, and so what I wanted to do is, um, again, we're really excited to kind of have this webinar again. We've done a number with Avexia. Avexia is, you know, our lead partner, frankly, in terms of distributors in the US. They do an outstanding job and have done so for a number of years. And I know I was, I had the fortune of being down with the team today and they've been adding uh, even more great employees to the team. So again, great company to work with. And again, we're very fortunate that we partnered with them. Uh, as part of that as well, um, as I say, we're launching our gut barrier panel that sits alongside the fit, the, uh, the fit test that we offer. So again, we're really excited to have the ability to make sure that now providers have got the ability to not only look at food sensitivities, but also have our gut barrier panel as well. So if we click onto the next slide, you'll see the offer um, that we're extending um, with Avexia tonight, uh, which gives you an opportunity to try not only the uh, the FIT 132 or the FIT 176, which include the gut barrier panel, but at a, at a significant discount of $100. So again, we want to offer that to um, all the clinicians, um, those who work with us through Avexia currently, and those who are obviously Avexia um, clients today and are looking to kind of uh, try the test. So again, we want to make sure we extend that offer to everyone. Dr. Rob will go into now more detail on the testing, but again, I just wanted to say we're excited to kind of give that offer to, tonight um, and kind of lead with that as well as make sure everyone's understanding that again, it's talking about our food sensitivity test, but also I think our, again, uh, gut barrier panel, which uh, Dr. Rob will go into how he uses it in his practice and some of the uh, clinical protocols that he's established as well. So without any further ado, uh, over to Dr. Rob uh, for the kind of meat and potatoes of this presentation. Thanks so much, James. It's always a pleasure sharing the stage with you. Um, I can tell you that testing and not guessing is without question the cornerstone of what I do in my functional medicine model in my um, office. And without question, the implementation of KBMO's gut barrier panel with association of the FIT food inflammation test has really been a um, keystone 
of enabling me to get to root cause resolution. Uh, the idea of really testing the gut barrier is, is not unique, but in that it's a patented test. And what I find, I mean, just real simple, uh, let's just dig in. 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. I believe the gut is the epicenter of your health. I believe in testing and not guessing. Your gut is where your macro and micronutrients are absorbed. So many of us sell supplements. One piece or one food for thought would be if our gut is leaky and our tight junctions are open, the vitamins that we prescribe are going to sip through and not get absorbed appropriately. And people are going to think our supplementation doesn't work. And we can go on and on and on. But that is one of the realities. I, I believe that the idea of gut barrier testing should be a baseline for all healthcare practitioners. And I do look forward to the day that many of our colleagues, both medical and non-medical, adopt that theory. With all that being said, let's really get into the effect of zonulin and food sensitivities on gut health. And let's share some protocols on how to ameliorate any kind of problems that would come from a proverbial leaky gut. So James had covered that. We'll go over that again later. I think that's a great deal. I think it's a great way to start. My suggestion is to do the test on your own. I did. I just recently did a test and to report to everybody, I didn't have a leaky gut. I had no gut barrier problems. Woo. But guess what? I had 11 food sensitivities. Now, remember, I'm somebody who at least I like to think really tries to take good care of themselves. No gluten, no dairy, no added sugar. Um, some people would say I'm a little meticulous about my diet. So that's a great, again, seeding. It's a starting point for us to discuss some of the case studies that we can go through and really build from the results of this exam. 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. In the year 2000, Dr. Alessio Fasano a GI doctor who's based at Harvard University who found the protein zonulin stated, all disease begins in the leaky gut. So I always like to start with a few factoids, a little food for thought, if you will. 75% of US adults say they have experienced GI symptoms a few times a month or more. So we're looking at almost three quarters. Let's piggyback on some of those ideas. 74% of the participants have lived with their GI symptoms for more than six months. And 56% of those with GI problems have not spoken with their primary care physician. So let's extrapolate what that all says. Approximately three fourths of the people sitting right in front of us have a gut issue. And many of them haven't discussed it, almost six out of 10, with their primary care physician. So it's incumbent on all of us to really start talking about gut health and gut barrier health with all our patients because clearly nobody else is doing it and we've got the right skill set for that unique conversation when you can ask the patients what have you done for your guts lately do you have the guts to be healthy so let's talk about some of the triggers of increased gut permeability clearly this is not a full litany of what could increase this uh, gut permeability. Increased gut permeability, i.e. leaky gut. I'm going to use those words interchangeably. Let's look at antibiotics. Well, without question, antibiotics. I am not anti-antibiotic. I hope that's not an oxymoron. So, of course, if I jump in a pond and get meningitis, I would take an antibiotic. If I had the staph infection and they were going to take a chunk of my leg out, I would take an antibiotic. But if I go to the doc, and I have a viral infection, and he said he wants to give me an antibiotic, I'm probably going to pause. So antibiotics are without question nuclear weapons to our gut. They don't, they don't discriminate between good and bad bacteria. They just blow everything up. It has been stated that one dose of antibiotics probably takes the ecosystem six to nine months to recover. Let's move on to acid blocking drugs. And this really is of note to me because I think for all the practitioners out there, if you would ask your patients, are you taking PPIs? Many of them would say yes. The duration of time a PPI is supposed to be ingested is four to six weeks. 
not four to six months, and not four to six years. Acid blocking drugs have a very deleterious effect on gut health, and they're clearly overused for a long duration of time. NSAIDs, non-steroid anti-inflammatories, they decrease pain, but they impair healing. Nutraceuticals decrease pain, but promote healing. Which do you prefer, Mr. and Mrs. Patients? NSAIDs will lead you down a slippery slope towards leaky gut and damage the blood-brain barrier. In addition, heavy metal exposure, environmental toxins, all contribute to leaky gut. Concussion of note, six out of 10 patients post-concussion either have leaky gut or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Concussion allows you to really understand the idea of the brain to gut axis, this bi-directional super highway to health, whatever duty brain, you duty gut, whatever you duty gut, you duty brain. Cesarean birth, these children are exposed to a different bacteria, vastly different bacteria than they are if they were to use the vaginal shoot. Liver toxicity, well, whatever you do to your liver, you do to your gut, whatever you do to your gut, you do to your liver, they are truly bidirectional. Gut dysbiosis, the unleveling of good and bad bacteria. I ask many of my attendees, how much good bacteria, percentage-wise, do you need not to have gut dysbiosis? Well, 85.1% will allow you not to have good dysbiosis with an appropriate bile diversity as a secondary characteristic. And of course, food sensitivities. This to me is a critical element. I believe food sensitivities are the backbone for many of our chronic inflammatory issues. And I do see that most Americans are pre-inflamed. So my mantra in my office is to manage and modulate inflammation. And one of the ways I do so is to test for food sensitivities. So why do you ask, what's the big secret? Why are food sensitivities so inflammatory? Well, most of us don't know that we have them. I didn't know that I had 11. To me, that's a decent amount for somebody who really tries to be, once again, meticulous about his diet. But the key, and this is the clinical gem to a food sensitivity, very simply is from the time to ingestion to the time that symptomology can reveal itself, it can be a 72 hour delay, three days. So how can the patient know they're sensitive to a food? And how can I as a practitioner know? You can't, and that's why testing and not guessing is a critical element when it comes to food sensitivities. Yeast and bacteria overgrowth, we're gonna go into some interesting detail about candida and how it actually is connected in a communication type of situation with your immune system, chronic stress, sleep deprivation, chronic inflammation, all damaging to the gut permeability, alcohol, gluten, which means glue and dairy. For me, they're all no buenos. Added sugar, 17% of the calories that are consumed by Americans are added sugar, artificial sweeteners, and maybe one of the hidden causes, we don't look at it enough, are food additives and emulsifiers. It's not necessarily the food we eat, it is the food that we, where the food was grown, how it was harvested, and what did they add to it. And to piggyback on that idea, a common food additive can adversely affect gut bacteria by driving up intestinal inflammation. So when you look at some of the selective food additives on the colon, here's a typical scenario. There's a disruption of the mucosal barrier, leading to ingestion of microorganisms leading to an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines, ultimately leading to inflammation. That inflammation can start as local inflammation. It can cascade through the bloodstream to systemic inflammation. And at some point, as I will show in some of the succeeding slides, appear its ugly head as autoimmunity. So fungi in the gut, candida, actually influence health and disease. Fungi loves to grow in the gut. The gut's a wonderful place to grow something. It's got nutrients, they're producers and consumers. It's moist and it's warm. Intestinal damage can be caused by an increase in candida overgrowth, which mimics and leads to irritable bowel disease. When your immune system is off balance, it cannot keep fungi in check and disease can ensue. Candida elicits a very strong immune response. And remember that intestinal damage that can be caused by candida resembles irritable bowel disease. My Dr. Rob's gut matrix. 
the, my Dr. Rob's Gut Matrix. James sees me present this at every one of my talks, my presentations. Again, I will reiterate, I believe the gut is the epicenter of your health. 80% of your immune system is in your gut. It's where your macro and micronutrients are absorbed. It has been postulated that the first time the outside world meets the inside world is when food, the small digested food particles to be exact, water, vitamins and minerals, pass the small intestine and get into the bloodstream. It's a fascinating organism, our body, because when something isn't right or something can be pathogenic, we have ways of stopping it, of getting through our small intestine. We call that regurgitation. That's one way, and obviously diarrhea being the other. When we talk about the gut, we talk about the small and the large intestine. The small intestine is not really small. It's narrow in its diameter, approximately an inch, but it's truly long, 20 to 52 feet in an average human, actually 22 feet to be exact in the average human. You unravel a small intestine, its surface area covers anywhere from a tennis to a basketball court. Small intestine has a single layer epithelial lining that has the thickness, check this out, of a wet paper towel. So when you can envision how easy it is to increase its permeability or rip its texture because its thickness is so narrow. The large intestine is the other part of the gut. It's a triple layer epithelial cell that should house the bulk of the bacteria. When you have damage and we call the gut leaky, it can usually be caused by some things. And one of the more common issues is food sensitivities, yeast, fungi, dysbiosis, unleveling of good and bad bacteria. When you have a toxic and chemical overload, you can have liver dysfunction. When you have blood sugar problems, insulin resistance, prediabetes, you can maybe attribute a, it to having a leaky gut. Obesity can also be correlated through the data to leaky gut. Interesting, we talked about autoimmunity. When people come in with a thyroid issue, I without question want to perform a gut barrier test and food sensitivities because the doorway to autoimmunity is your gut. Chiropractors, naturopaths, physical therapists, manual medical doctors, leaky gut leads you down a path of something called the gut to joint axis. It does so by being leaky, the gut, increasing the incidence and the release of cytokines. Cytokines will increase your incidence of arthritis and joint pain as your gut to joint axis. In addition, MMPSs, matrix metalloproteinases, your body's own proteolytic enzymes are released at the time of injury. They can damage soft tissue. They eat fibrocartilage. And yes, your discs, your intervertebral discs are made of fibrocartilage, which just shows the gut to disc axis, European Spine Journal, February 2022. And lastly, your superhighway to health, gut to brain and brain to gut. Whatever you do to your gut, you do to your brain. Whatever you do to your brain, you do to your gut. So hopefully this PowerPoint is able to work and it becomes quite evocative. The white balls are small digested food particles. The blue colored balls are large digested food particles. I have an arrow pointing to a healthy cell tight junction, perfectly named, and a healthy microvilli, which are finger-like projections, which grab for good digestive absorption. The leaky gut conversely has damaged cell junctions and damaged microvilli, which are going to allow both the small and the large digestive um, food particles to get through. Lesio Fasano said in a seminar that I attended, the gut is not Vegas. What happens in the gut doesn't stay in the gut. The gut to brain connection, and I do say the gut to brain, not brain to gut. It is truly getting to the root cause of the broken brain. So if you will, when the gut is on fire, their brain's on fire. When the gut and brain is on fire, there are no symptoms of pain since the brain has no pain receptors and the inner lining of the GI mucosal has no pain fibers. When the gut and the pain are on fire or inflamed, the typical symptoms are bloating followed immediately by brain fog. Inflammation of the brain's neurons in the brain does not cause pain, instead reduces nerve conduction. This reduced nerve conduction results in slow nerve transmission that is typically described as brain fog. So real simple, ask your patients, do you get gas and bloating after you eat? Well, if you do, you're not supposed to. Do you get brain fog 45 minutes after you eat? 
You're not supposed to. What I just depicted is what will typically happen with many people. Imagine me, and James has me teaching lunches. So they start out and you, you know they start with the gas and bloating and by the time they're at the end of my hour lunch, they start kicking back. It's not me, they've got a gut problem. They've got a gut to brain barrier problem and they've got a gut barrier problem. So hopefully this becomes more lifelike now. The left side has perfectly tight junctions. The right side is leaky inflamed. These toxins pass through. They burrow their way through mucosal membrane cells. They get into the bloodstream. You have an immune reaction, IgG, IgA, all being released from B and T cells, ultimately resulting in nutrient malabsorption, autoimmunity, food sensitivities, blood-brain barrier breach, and systemic inflammation. Molecular mimicry. It's a question that I'm asked every time. What is molecular mimicry? Well, it's a molecule that mimics something else. And it does so, interestingly enough, because foods that we ingest have something called a protein sequence or very fancily named a motif. This protein sequence is like an amino acid sequence. They're typically up to 15 numbers and letters. In that motif, foods can mimic parts of your body, joints, glands, and such. So to put it in a tight nutshell, gluten and dairies protein sequence is very similar to the cerebellum in your brain and specific joints through in your body. So when your immune system gets confused, is overrun or just dysfunctional, it begins not to attack the, the foreign particle like gluten and dairy. It gets confused and also attacks self, like what I mentioned before, a cerebellum, a joint. So here's my take as we speed up on food sensitivities. Food sensitivities have an effect on health. They have a systemic inflammatory response. Skin reactions, you'll see them as part of the immune system. So a lot of people say, ah, it's just a rash. Well, that rash, that skin in the olden days was a critical marker to allow people to understand what was going on inside the body was being extressed via the epidermis. Hey, Come to my office on Monday morning, people could walk in with joint pain, muscle pain, GI symptoms, and brain fog. How am I supposed to know the origin, the root cause, if I don't test for food sensitivities since there's a gut to joint and a gut to disc axis? Anxiety, depression, and mood, interestingly enough, they are the number one symptomologies that abate when you remove food sensitivities. Number two, gas and bloating and any kind of brain fog. There's neurodegeneration, autoimmune issues, fatigue, and body composition issues. So let's take a pretty nice overview of food sensitivities. In that, food sensitivities, I believe, are undercounted when we say 100 million people. I believe it's vastly undercounted. However, the prevalence of food sensitivities in the research has really increased vastly in the last few years, 50% in adults and 70% in children. The symptoms vary. But one of the salient takeaways is 90% of sensitivities are in eight food groups, milk, soy, eggs, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish. Delayed food sensitivities, as I said before, are in a delay of up to 72 hours after ingestion. Here's a difference maker. Delayed food sensitivities are typically caused by IgG, or I should say, if you want to understand food sensitivities, the first thing you want to test for is IgG. And everybody knows what IgG is, it's an antibody. It's part of your adaptive specific immune system. Many companies test IgG one and two. The IgG has four subtypes. IgG obviously one through four. IgG three, IgG three, excuse me, is quite unique in that it also stimulates your immune complex, which ultimately stimulates the most stable inflammatory molecule called C3D. So the KBMO diagnostic test is based on a double test in that you're testing both IgG and immunity via the innate immune system in the complement. So there's no, um, I, I guess the best way for me to put it in layman's term is there's no question about it. This is why the test is so accurate and it's a true difference maker utilizing this test versus others. 
when we talk about food allergies versus food sensitivities, a food allergy will know right away. I mean, how many times have we been on a plane and somebody said, please, please don't eat any peanuts. Somebody has a food allergies, it's immediate IgE. Food sensitivities are again, are vastly different. They're IgG, they're delayed reactions. They don't respond quite as quickly, creates an inflammatory cascade. You're testing the food protein, inflammatory responses are slow, and it's truly hard to determine which food could be the culprit. <clears throat> so my goal when I put my Sherlock Holmes hat on and use my microscope is I want to detect the triggers, proteins, infections, toxin, chemicals, and pathogens. I want to remove those. I also want to repair the barriers. I want to repair that gut barrier. And lastly, I want the body to communicate because I believe that when it communicates appropriately, it's harmonizing. It sounds like a mellifluous soliloquy. That's what health should sound like. So many practitioners ask me, and I'll probably repeat this a few times, why should they use the test? Real simple, here's a takeaway. It tests food sensitivities, inflammation, and gut permeability in all one test. And by looking at immune complex issues and inflammation that are associated with foods, it really is looking at underlying problems for the conditions that I see in my practice on a daily basis. So when do providers use a fit test? That's another FAQ, if you will, real simple. If someone's trying to lose weight, obviously they're not absorbing nutrients, they wanna eat more, could be a leaky gut, they could be inflamed, could be a food sensitivity, autoimmune disease, migraines, thyroid, any patient that has arthritis, brain fog, and or fatigue, and of course, lastly, any kind of digestive gut and or skin, because there is a gut to skin axis. So here's a list of the top 20 foods positive for food sensitivities in alphabetical order. Almonds, bananas, beef, brewer's yeast, candida, casein, chicken, corn, cow's milk, egg white, egg yolk, gluten, peanut, pineapple, salmon, shrimp, soybean, tomato, white potato, and whole wheat. So let's take a look at what we would refer to as the client report. Take a good look at this. Color coordinated. I like it because it screams to me. The red is a plus four. Obviously, it's a beeping red. We got to stop. We got to remove it ASAP. Orange catches my attention. It's a plus three. Yellow, we need to slow down, proceed with caution. It's a plus two. And lime green, mm, interesting. That's a plus one. So a little clinical nugget. If you've got 10 or more food sensitivities that are in a two to four response ratio, I typically in my office, and I'll have James share his input um, from speaking to hundreds of providers through the US and abroad on if they remove the ones. I happen to, I don't wanna muddy the water. The whole purpose to this slide is to see the color coordination. Now, if it resonates with me, and I actually know what this means, imagine how easy it is to resonate with the patient. And when the patient understands it, they're more compliant, our protocols are much more efficient. In addition, they're also testing for food additives, which I think is a great addition. And we were discussing it last night on another um, call that there'll be more food additives coming to this very impressive list already. So why do we care about chemical additives? The takeaway here is chemical additives can damage the gut permeability and increase gut barrier permeability. You're not only measuring in this slide when you look at the immune complex formation, the upstream in terms of exposure via IgG one through four, but also the downstream, the alternative pathway, which is as was pointed out when the complement is activated, leads to inflammation and symptoms. So immune complexes, deposit in tissues, you stimulate complement activation, you have inflammation, you have symptoms. But for me, the takeaway, look at the left side, look at the right side of the gut. You have the left side, you've got a leaky gut. Obviously the tight junctions are now what we call loose junctions. But the right side at the lamina propria, totally different texture, totally different size. What people don't realize is that an extended leaky gut could lead you down a path of autoimmunity, and not just autoimmunity in joints and glands, autoimmunity at the gut level. And I think this vivifies that concept, or at least this slide does. 
The takeaway to this slide is many companies will just typically use only one signal. Whereas when you compare and contrast with the leaders in food sensitivities and gut barrier permeability, KBMO, they're looking at two different signals. So once again, to reiterate, people ask, why do we use this particular FIT test? Because it's a dual pathway measurement. It tests the acquired and the innate immunity. It does so in the acquired immunity by measuring antibodies, one, IgG one through four, the full complement of the subtypes, and innate immunity measuring the complement C3D. You know, I asked a whole bunch of my docs who don't do food sensitivity, give me the most stable immune molecule or inflammatory molecule, and people were stumped. And I realized it's something that sometimes we have to go back in time, but the data is there to and allow this dual pathway measurement to really resonate in my head. Effective epithelial barriers are linked to a myriad of chronic diseases and chronic issues, especially like food sensitivities. And as we all know, changes in the gut microbiome via dysbiosis can lead us down a path of autoimmune issues, metabolic disorders, and neurodegeneration. So why can't we just assume every patient's gut is leaky? Why do we have to test? Because everybody's gut isn't leaky. My gut wasn't leaky. James's gut in the last test was not leaky. So having said that, you want to get a starting point. Again, testing, not guessing. And the actual report has shown to improve patient compliance. They know where they are. Look at my compliance. I would have never taken out sardines. I don't eat sardines. I didn't know that was the sardines in my fish oils. That was a problem. When in my life would I decrease the amount of turmeric? I love turmeric. My wife uses it as an herb. It's a beautiful herb to cook with. I use it in many of my supplements. Got a little food sensitivity. I have to go another route to use NF-kappa B inhibitors. So the real question is, and I think I'm leading to it is, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Food sensitivities or leaky gut? The bottom line is leaky gut can lead to food sensitivities. Food sensitivities can lead to leaky gut. We want to attenuate both. And here is the new improved FIT food inflammation test gut barrier panel. The gut barrier panel in the FIT test 132 and 176 automatically includes gut barrier panel and it tests for candida, zonulin, and occluded. It's testing for IgG one through four, C3D, and something I didn't mention before, IgA one and two. IgA one and two, you'll see in a succeeding slide, is secretory. Candida, in this particular test, you were negative for candida expression, but zonulin and occluded, which we'll go through what it means, were expressed and were positive for expression. IgA, there's two types of IgA. It's IgA is 85, IgA1 is 85% of the concentration. IgA2 is 15% of the concentration. IgA shows a good immune response to protein enzymes and LPS, whereas IgA2 is actually fighting the LPS lipopolysaccharide antigens. IgA is secretory. It means there's damage at the gut level. Candida grows when bacteria is suppressed or immune system is weakened. So if you've got a candida overgrowth, you probably have dysbiosis, but you certainly have a compromise to your immune system. Zonulin, and this is where the rubber hits the road. Zonulin is a protein that opens these tight junction proteins. The protein from gluten called gliadin and intestinal bacteria are the main triggers for zonulin release. Taking it to the next step, how does KBMO differentiate themselves from the competition? They use an anti-zonulin antibody. Let's take the next step with that. What does that all mean? Well, zonulin, which as we know was founded in 2000 by Alessio Fasano, is a protein that is synthesized in intestinal and liver cells. It's a key biomarker for intestinal permeability. It's the only reversible regulator of intestinal permeability, and its elevated levels of zonulin are associated with autoimmune disease, celiac disease, adult glucose intolerance, inflammatory bowel, obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver. Now we're looking at what we call occluding. I'm going to pop my camera on 
I'm going to share my webcam right now. Can everybody see me? Because my webcam, uh, for some reason, I can't see. Somebody want to tell me? Give me a thumbs up. Can everybody see me? Yeah, I can see. Rob, you're good. Yep. Yep, yep. All good, Doc. Thanks. Thanks, gentlemen. Everybody take a look. Here's my left hand. Here's my right hand. Here's an epithelial cell. Here's another epithelial cell. I'm going to interlock them nice and tight. Right now, I do not have leaky gut. It's tight. Zonulin is being expressed at a high level over duration of time. It is a functional pull to the tight junctions. They're still in contact, but they're now permeable. The tight junction has loosened. Zonulin will show you the expression of pressure to the tight junctions. Occluding, if you take a good look, will show you the structural fault in the tight junctions. So zonulin is step one, occluding is step two. Obviously, an elevation of zonulin is not good. An elevation of zonulin occluding is obviously the next step. It's worse. And what you've got there is you've got zonulin being a structure, a functional marker and occluding being a structural marker. And that's why I put that slide in there. Occluding has actually got 15 years of evidence. It plays a critical role in the regulation of tight junction integrity. Here's the clinical gem. Clinicians, here's what this means. Occluding is essential in tight junction stability and barrier function. Coupled together, zonulin and occludin are the gatekeepers of these tight junction proteins. They prevent large molecules from passing the intestinal barrier into the bloodstream, where they can not only elicit an immune response, localized systemic effect, systemic stomach effect, and that immune response also can lead you to autoimmune responses. Not only creates antibodies, it creates something called autoantibodies. So speaking of something that creates autoantibodies, COVID. James told everybody, you know, I'm back at work this week. Last week, I contracted COVID. I'm not bragging about it. I'm not happy about it. But the first thing I did this week when I went back was I took a gut barrier test because inflammation promotes excessive gut permeability. There was an increase in tight junction permeability and a lot of severe COVID. Didn't have it severe. Mine was very mild, but there were steep increases seen in zonulin release and occluding release. So the tight junctions were compromised. Interesting because here the SARS-CoV-2 virus is in the GI tract, epithelial expresses the zonulin, the failure of tight junctions are increased in intestinal permeability, and ultimately SARS-CoV-2 and systemic circulation is hyperinflammation. I'm going to pull the reins back. What am I saying? Number one, viruses are shed through the intestinal tract. They're shed through your gut. So if you have a leaky gut, many of the viruses that you're trying to shed and rid of will get through your gut lining because it's leaky, get back into your bloodstream and it'll cause hyperinflammatory response. In addition, as the previous slide talked about, zonulin and occludin are elevated and COVID can cause leaky gut. It makes a lot of sense when we take a step back, turn the dial of the left and right down and just look at how the body works we begin to realize 80% of our immune cells are in our gut. So COVID has an impact on the GI tract by a loss of diversity, loss of beneficial bacteria, expansion of pro-inflammatory bacteria, expansion of yeast, and increases the incidence of leaky gut. So doctors, practitioners, colleagues, when someone comes in, whether it was three weeks ago, three months ago, six months ago, or a year ago, you may want to test their barrier function post COVID-19. Great example of what COVID can do is break that biological barrier. It also causes a mechanical barrier alteration, leading to immune barrier alterations. Ultimately, you will see bacteria translocation, leading to increased interleukins, TNF-alpha, and oxidative stress. So again, difference makers. I'm big on difference makers because I believe I've, I was grown, I grew up in New York, if you didn't notice from the accent, but contrast leads to persuasion. Some of the problems with many of the zonulin testing out there is people are getting cross-reactivity because they're testing for haptoglobin and propadine. 
and they can't make their mind up between serum and or poop. Well, you're not going to get a good reading or an accurate reading for zonulin through the poop, but you will through serum. And the beauty of it, if you draw blood, you can draw the blood serum. If not, I don't draw blood in my office. It's a finger spot or a blood spot. So convenient so easy and james will share with you the world health organization has a, um, an article out that talks about a statistical equality of serum and blood spot let's go to the top because of the unique recumbent zonulin protein you eliminate half the globin and propodein you do not get the cross reactivity and you get an appropriate positivity rate again when you piggyback that with the idea of serum and or blood spots, you're getting the most accurate leading edge test on the market today. So the conclusions of the KBMO fit test are very simple. Measures 176 foods, colorings, and additives. It's a dual pathway detection technology, testing for IgG one through four and complement. Complement generates inflammation, so you're truly testing for C3D. You've got the anti zonulin antibody, a mark of gut permeability. The unique gut barrier panel is now included. There's several great outcomes backed by the IRB. And the finger stick makes it quick, easy. And especially for those who can't draw blood or don't want to draw blood in the office, it's quite versatile. So what else does zonulin do? And why else would we want to test for it? Essentially, zonulin is a health marker. So higher levels of zonulin have been associated with a higher waist circumference blood pressure, fasting glucose, and increased risk of metabolic disease. It makes sense. Leaky gut leads you down to that Dr. Rob's gut matrix. So this is what the new gut barrier panel looks like. Not only do you have the fit test on the left, you've got a mimicking in the, a duplication of that gut barrier panel that I showed you before. So all color coordinated, very, very patient friendly, very, very patient, complimentary. And um, again, I'm trying to look for some simplistic ideas so we can just say it to our patients. It allows the outcomes to and the issues to resonate with the patients because of its accuracy and its color coordination. So there's some clinical studies here. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview because I really think that everybody's going to have a lot of questions. Um, here's a fit test before the elimination diet, taking out the food sensitivities. So you see a specific increase in um, symptomology complaints, whereas when you take it out, there's a precipitous drop. Again, take a good look at these symptoms, memory concentration, Anxiety and mood are at the top. They actually decrease more than bloating and stomach pain and fatigue. As we all know, irritable bowel syndrome puts a tremendous cost on American um, healthcare system, and about 20% of Americans have it. Study was done by Dr. Isafili. And in that, let's really look at the visual analog scale and let's also look at blood tests, which we know are purely objective, which have no subjectivity. So here was an IBS severity score test. You had an intervention group and a control group. You see a three times increase, or I should say decrease, in abdominal pain, days, bloating, and bowel habits via what I would call like a visual analog scale. Homocysteine, a stroke marker, you're seeing a tremendous decrease in the intervention group, whereas the control group actually increased in their homocysteine markers, which would make me very concerned about their overall health outcomes. C-reactive protein, a tissue inflammation marker, five times the improvement in the intervention group. This again is people just removing their food sensitivities. No other treatments, not the 7R that I'm going to share with you, no other treatments. By doing this particular type of removal of these food sensitivities, the results of the IBS study tests were a 50% reduction in primary care and specialty office visits. So at the end of the day, 
The clinical outcomes in IBS were greatly improved when using the FIT test because the FIT test resulted in twice the IBS severity score compared with other cellular tests and resulted in a 50% improvement in IBS severity score compared with tests that measure only IgG1 and 2. So the conclusion was very simply put, clinical outcomes for IBS greatly improve when using the FIT test to predict food sensitivities. As we all know, we live in a gut-busting world. So as James said, we're gonna offer you some solutions. Here is my Super 7 R action plan. We work with several different supplement companies and we, I can, if you're anybody's interested, reach out to me and we can punch in the products and the protocols in a more elaborate detail. So the first R, if you will, would be to reset, reset your diet. Big proponent of taking out gluten, the, an acronym I use is GPS, no gluten, no processed food, no sugar, DNA, no dairy, no nicotine, no artificial sweeteners, no deep fried foods, no vegetable oils, because there's no vegetables and vegetable oils, there's seed oils. Change people's diets, slowly but surely, one thing at a time. Let's start incorporating a health lifestyle mindset. Number two, remove, remove unwanted pathogens. This is where you remove the food sensitivities to start. The food sensitivities are incorporated in the second R. Also, by removing pathogens, you want to remove all these pathogens or these antigens, if you will. So for the upper respiratory area, oregano oil. For the lower bowel, you would use berberine garlic as your natural antibiotic. And the secret sauce for that would be serum bovine immunoglobin, a non-jerry usage of serum bovine immunoglobin, which binds to multiple pathogens. I like to refer to it as the mop of the gut. Number three, replace. What are we replacing? Stomach acids, digestive enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, increasing bile flow, all replacing to aid in digestion. 60 to 70% of Americans have a digestive problem. Regenerate, repair, heal and seal the gut lining. This is when you're gonna use your plethora of different nutrients to allow your tight junctions to heal and to create an anti-inflammatory microenvironment in your gut. Number five, re-inoculate with what? Pre and probiotics. I don't believe in giving just a probiotic. I believe in giving a prebiotic. Prebiotic fiber feeds a probiotic, which makes a metabolite, which is now caused a postbiotic which is sort of like what's left of the probiotic. So pre to pro equals a postbiotic. This is the new types of formulation that are being used in the proverbial functional medicine world. Reintroduce, reintroduce what? This is when you would retest and reintroduce. You would retest using the gut barrier and food sensitivity test. And if you didn't want to at this point, and James made this point yesterday and I, and I, and I stole it from him. If you don't want to retest and just want to slowly reintroduce the foods, you should at least retest the gut barrier because if their gut is still permeable, you got to keep working within those first five R's. So here you would reintroduce certain foods that were moved in step two. A big clinical takeaway is just because you have a food sensitivity does not mean you have to remove that food for perpetuity. And lastly, retain. Retain your health and your GI integrity. How would you do that? Obviously, you'd adhere to a lifestyle, a good diet, multivitamin, multimineral, fish oil, omega-3 fatty acid, a probiotic, and probably a good fruits and greens drink and or a collagen. So for me, the most effective clinical outcomes across all disease spectrums can result from the normalization of gut function. The gut is the epicenter of your health. Now, I went through this. I hit about the 10 minute to eight mark. Um, there's a lot about food sensitivities. This is my upcoming book. It is out now. You can go to immunereboot.com and you can order the ebook today or you can pre-order the paperback. Um, there's 10 chapters in there. I, I immediately go to chapter 10. It's all about recipes. In about four of the different chapters, you'll hear about food sensitivities and gut permeability. So you'll see highlights and some in-depth policy details with a couple of uh, bumper stickers, things that you can tell your patients. Um, Immune Reboot really came out of the uh, idea of 
back in March of 2020, we were closed down. I didn't know who to turn to, where to go to get an immune specialist. By May of 2020, it was something called long haulers. And I just threw myself in for the next two and a half years to write a book and learn everything I could about immune system. And I can tell you this, with 80% of your immune cells being in your gut, it's a great thing to test for. Mark Twain, before we get to questions and I bring James back on, he said famously, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born, and everybody knows that day, because we show our driver's license, et cetera, all the time, and the day you found out why. As everybody may know, I suffer from congenital torticollis, and I was lost. I didn't know what to do. At 21 years old, I went to a chiropractor, and the Star Spangled Banner went off, you know, and I just finished up my business degree, and I, I was just on a mission to learn as much as I could. And I always wanted to learn how to fix the body from the inside out, because even at that point, 30 some odd years ago, that particular doctor made such an indelible mark on my thought. He was always asking why, and the why from the inside really turned into the functional medicine model and really got highlighted by gut and gut permeability. So if anybody has any questions, I think we have some slides oh. after. Yeah. I'm going to pop my uh, camera on. James is going to come back on. Yep. Very inspiring. Uh, James, take it away. Love it. So again, um, I think there was the that offer again was on the next slide, I think, or if not. Right, well, um, true. We, I mean, we can jump ahead if you'd like, and then we can go no, back. No, no, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do questions with Dr. Rob, and then uh, yeah. again, if we want, we can just quickly go back to the gut barrier panel, because again, just want to quickly go over a couple of other points on that. Okay. So, uh, but let's, let's, let's wait to send some questions. Some questions we can do that. Otherwise, I'll uh, I'll, I'll just yeah, going to add. Sure. Add um, so I'm just going to uh, chime in with uh, Dr. Sedano. Um, any insights, Doctor? Uh, I, Dr. Rob covered this so well, so complete. Um, he really left me with no, no questions. It, it certainly to highlight the whole idea that you get with this particular test. You're looking at two different aspects. You're looking at the, like you said, the IgG1 through IgG4 and the complement. You're getting a double read on the food sensitivities. And that's, that's the real charm to this. That gut barrier, I was looking at a couple of reports that came through uh, about, about a, a couple of weeks ago. And I said, this thing is like going to be the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. When you're looking at the Ig IgA and the, the, the Candida, Xinolin, Occludin, you got the whole package here, so I'm very impressed. But James and Dr. Rob, thank you for the efforts of putting this together. You know, Dr. Wayne, I really like the concise manner in which you said it. And, and you know, many of the questions are based on if IgG is positive versus IgA. And that would be a great discussion point because, as we know, IgA is at the gut level, at the secretory level. And IgG is, means that it's past the gut. Yeah. You're looking at that. You're looking at that immune response, right? Right at the <laughs> look at the secretary IgA and how you know how important is that uh, to to really get get a handle on what's going on. We see the IgA on all on a stool analysis. I mean, a lot of doctors when when they're doing you know the, the functional stool analysis testing, that's one of the first things that they're really looking at, and that's the immune response. And uh, this, <laughs> this just marries that together so so well. And I think one of the other things we've added as well is, um, you know, when you look at that report, you know, in terms of we've, we've got a line in there about interpretation as well. So again, if any of those six markers are uh, elevated, then we recommend, uh, you know, talking to your provider about some, some gut healing protocol. I know that Avexia crew are working on some of those as well at the moment. We've worked with um, Biotics, Nutridine, some of the other kind of big um, supplement players as well. So. Uh, again, as Dr. Rob said, we're happy to provide some of those around, but I know the uh, Avexia team are kind of pulling some of those together as well. So again, I think that would be a neat way of, if you think about it, you know, you get the test, you get the great meal plan that comes with the test, you get the patient app as well. So again, there's real value in terms of the test. Obviously, you've got the multiple um, pathways as, as you were describing, Dr. Sedano, but again, following on from that, it's a kind of package approach. And as again, as we think about you know, people being challenged in terms of, you know, how do I afford testing? The idea here was to make sure that there's an investment in compliance tools as well as follow on in terms of, as you know, Dr. Sadano, one of the first questions from most patients is, so what can I eat? So with that meal plan, that's really helpful in terms of answering that question. 
And again, not providing more work for you guys when you're already overworked as it were already. Um, and again, with the patient app that's now available. So again, and, that, and on that app, it shows them the foods they're sensitive to and shows them a little bit more information about each of those. It shows them the meal plan. And then the great thing about that is if it's on their phone, which obviously the app is, it then means that they can go grocery shopping and, and take it from there. The other neat thing about the app is what we found is that patients really love to share the app with their friends and family. So it becomes a referral tool for your practice. And I know all you providers love to do your marketing. So again, it's a, neat, it's a great marketing tool within the practice that, that, the, uh, that the app creates as well. And as I said, with the new gut barrier panel, we've now added some of these protocols. So again, it gives you some great paths forward in terms of what supplements you need to kind of hand out to your patients as well. But based on those testing results, which again is uh, gives them a nice way forward and it's written on the report. So again, hopefully what you'll see is patients coming back to the providers and saying, look, you know, it says here, if any of these markers are elevated, I need to look at, you know, going on a gut healing protocol. And as I said, Dr. Rob and I are happy to kind of provide some of those, but I know the Avexia team are working on some of those as well. Great, great. Okay, so we have a few questions, Dr. Silverman. Um, first question, does the way the food is prepared have an effect on the testing, such as cooked versus raw? James, you want to answer that? Because I get that question all the time. I know yeah, no, we, we, we cover off both um, raw and cooked, so that's fine. Uh, again, yes, there's no no doubt about it that, you know, obviously the foods get denatured in that cooking process. Um, what we haven't yet, what we're yet to see is anyone actually then come up with some, okay, how does that impact things clinically? So yes, in, in full agreement with all the companies out there in terms of yes, there's a denaturing process. We haven't seen any data from anyone that says, okay, uh, cooked or raw, what does that mean from a clinical perspective in terms of a clinical trial versus, I think, the, the, the obvious of is it cooked or raw? But we do have cooked and raw foods on the, uh, on, on the panel. And uh, so I think, yeah, we're, we're, that, that, that's coped with or, or dealt with uh, in the panel that we, that we look at. Great, great. Okay. Uh, second question. What do you do when a client is sensitive to almost everything on the list? You know, James and I were talking about that yesterday, and that happens in rare occasions, but it does happen. Um, now, I, I hate to answer a question with another question. W did that person have a leaky gut? Let's assume they did for now. So if they had a leaky gut, I'm going to go and fix the gut first from my perspective. And I would retest at that point because that is without, qu you know, if you're looking at 50, 40, 60 different food sensitivities. I mean, it can happen. It's not the norm. So I would, one, if it was a leaky gut, that would be a problem. Two, if not, you know, there have been times that I removed 40 or 50 or 60 foods, but I have such a large, I have a surfet number of foods in my food list that's gluten-free and dairy-free. There's still enough to eat from. But first, I would definitely look, and I think Dr. Sedano may want to chime in on that also, from a functional medicine perspective, really want to check the gut and different barriers. Yeah, I, I, with that question, first thing, I'm, I'm looking at an elemental diet. I'm taking the pressure off the gut, just right out, right out of the gate. And then probably follow up with a stool analysis, look at that pancreatic elastase one, make sure there's no pancreatic insufficiency. Next, find out if they're on proton pump inhibitors, because that, that can create a whole problem. And I, and I tell my patients and and you know people that, that call on this the, the gut does not want to see meat inside it wants to see amino acids dipeptides and tripeptides that's it anything other there's probably going to be a, an allergic response to that somewhere along the line so that's you know, my approach to that and allow the gut enough time to heal and 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 do the seven r's like dr rob said james how many times yeah, the only thing i the only thing i'd add to that is is a couple of things first of all um, I don't think I've ever seen that number of foods in terms of with our approach, because again, you're doing, we're looking at the IgG one through four, so the exposure. So that sounds almost like a patient who's only done an IgG test because it's told them what they're exposed to. When you then go on and look at the complement to then work out of that long list of foods, which ones are actually causing inflammation, we'll generally only see five to 15. So it's un highly unusual to see that number. But again, I'm sure it can happen, so I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that they've seen it in, uh, with maybe another test. Um, the other thing is, again, both, both the doctors quite rightly said, let's, let's you know, test you know, to see what's going on from a gut barrier standpoint. 
what we've also done is we split out that gut barrier panel so you can order it separately intentionally for retesting because again the whole idea is yes run it for the food sensitivities and the leaky gut and as dr roll quite rightly pointed out you know which ones comes first you know chicken and egg it can be one the other then you know vice versa but the concept was let's make sure we split that out so that you can retest just that so again in a patient in this kind of instance where it's clearly some kind of leaky gut issues going on let's heal the gut and then let's retest to make sure that gut's healed versus necessarily going on and worrying too much about the food sensitivities James and dr robin just if you can tell our our, our the, the the attendees one more time about the zonulin and the antibody because that's a jewel that i hopefully no one missed and i think it's worth repeating for you know 30 seconds or so if you would sure, sure as a matter of fact well i'm going to piggyback on what james said i'm happy you said about the test so there are companies and and there are times that a test is aberrant and what you, have you ever had a cholesterol test not to get off topic and everything was in the range that you liked you did your particle size you did your apoba and all that and your triglycerides so somebody's triglycerides were 500 so, something insane you know that the test can be aberrant it happens and i really want to concur with james that i have not seen that patient that had like a gazillion different things in food sensitivities because of the accuracy of the test so i am going to go backwards very quickly and get to that the anti-zonulin antibody well first of all and james please at any time please feel free to interject Number one, they're actually testing for zonulin. They're not testing for another protein enzyme. You know, there's 14 protein, excuse me, there's 40 protein enzymes uh, in, the, in the tight junction. So they're actually testing for zonulin using an anti-zonulin antibody. When they weren't testing for zonulin and using this antibody, many of the companies were getting very low positivity rates or insane positive rates. I mean, everybody's, I got a leaky gut, I got a leaky gut. Yeah, I'm sure we all may have a leaky gut at some point in our life, but if everybody on this call took a test, everybody on this call would not have a leaky gut. So that anti-zonulin antibody, testing for zonulin is really the secret sauce to the zonulin test. And, I, and James can give you a little more, as much yeah, I mean, as- I think just to add to that, I mean, we we had the kind of dream team, as I call them, of, of Dr. Brent Dorval, who you know who, who invented our the fit test and works with us still today, uh, and working with uh, alongside Dr. Alessio Fasano, and and what they came up with, and and you can see it in the literature. I mean, it's it's in all the papers now about about the previous zonulin tests that were available that they were cross-reacting to Dr. Rob's point with um, haptoglobin, properdin, and various complement fragments. So we went back to basics and spent the last four years developing a specific um, you know, antibody to, to Rob's point, to Dr. Rob's point, which does not cross react with those. So that's why we have a positivity rate, which mimics very closely what um, Fasano had published in his Lancet paper back in early 2000. So that's the key to this test. But again, a bit like with our food sensitivity test, rather than just stopping at IgG only, we added the complement to make sure it was a much more accurate test. With this panel, we've come up with the best um, zonulin panel uh, test on the market. But again, as I'm sure you guys would both agree, zo um, you know, leaky gut's a continuum. So rather than just saying, here's a really good zonulin marker, that's why we added the candida and also the occludin with the IgG and the IgA to recognize that it is a continuum and it's not just one marker that's going to catch it it could be a, a variety of markers out there and that's why we look at really those six markers as part of that gut barrier panel versus just saying look we've got the best zonulin test on the market you know let's make sure from a clinical standpoint it can be a lot more useful by adding the igg as well as the iga to look at is it you know is it the security level or is it kind of more systemic Okay, and uh, we have, uh, we'll say one more question. Uh, do you ever see complement without an antibody reaction? Uh, do, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, I mean, occasionally will. And again, that the way we set up the test is that, you know, you're looking at the, uh, at really a double screen. So you're looking at what is the patient exposed to, i.e. the classical IgG one through four, 
and again, as Rob showed in the slides, some great tests out there that just look at IgG. The limitation is, is that pathway, not those companies, i.e. when you just look at IgG, you're only looking at what a patient's exposed to. The complement is attached to that to say, we're finding out what you're exposed to, but then which ones come up with complements. So yeah, so it's we're always seeing the complement in terms of that will kind of trigger it up to say, is it what you know a severe or you know moderate in terms of the the color coded report that Dr. Rob showed as well. So yeah, it's very rare, if impossible, really to say that we'll just see IgG. It's IgG plus the complement because what we're trying to work out is you know from a root cause standpoint which foods are causing inflammation versus which foods are you're looking at from an exposure standpoint which as i say is the igg only companies and as i say great companies limitation is that pathway not those companies great great okay well now we'll move on um dr silverman if you could uh, jump back to the end of the slide deck that'd be great um to the one right after questions second there you go so uh, right now we're just going to highlight a few of Vexia uh, services here is the ask the doctor um, service it's a free service for our all of our clients um, where you'll have access to dr. Wayne Sedano who you've heard tonight um, you can uh, get um, review test results clinical conditions um, recommendations um, it's you you log in to your a platform on the left side there's quick links to ask the doctor at that point you can uh, submit your 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 uh, questions or test results um, he gets back to you very quickly right doctor I would I would say sometimes it's, within a day uh, usually within hours unless it's the weekend yeah, within hours and then there's also a for an additional fee a, a direct telephone or video conference option um, so Please, uh, you know, if you're an Avexia client, take advantage of that. Uh, next slide, please, doctor. About back to our uh, November offer. I don't know, uh, James, do you want to uh, reiterate this or do you, or you want me to? Yeah, I, mean, I think as I said, I know, I mean, yeah, I, I talked to a lot of providers and, and generally, again, one of the first things that they all want to do is I want to run the test on myself before I offer it to my patient. So again, I think it's a great offer from a vaccine to say, look, let's discount that heavily to make sure that you've got that opportunity to run the test. And as you say, you've got that great opportunity to then also talk about talk with Dr. Sedana about those results before you then implement it in your practice. So uh, again, I think it's a great offer in terms of enabling you to do that. Or again, it looks like you can get five test kits here as well if you're maybe a provider already already running the, the food sensitivity test. Or again, if you've used KBMO in the past but weren't aware of the new um, gut barrier panel, what a great opportunity to now run that as part of this and also kind of seek some uh, some advice from uh, from Dr. Sedano at the same time. Okay, great, great. Uh, next slide, doctor. Okay, so now that we've learned so much about uh, food sensitivity and zonulin, I'd like to review how to order the test uh, before concluding the webinar. Uh, first, you will need to log into your Avexi account and go to the Avexi link order, ordering via the quick links on the left side of the dashboard. Um, you then will select or create a patient to assign the test to, uh, go to specialty labs, and then go to the KBMO test tab, locate the fit test of your choice, and finally complete the test ordering by clicking the green place order button. It's just that simple. Um, next slide, please, doctor. Um, for any questions or issues, you may contact Avexia Diagnostics by email at info at avexiadiagnostics.com or by phone five days a week at extended hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time at 888-852-2723. Uh, next slide, doctor, please. Thank you, Dr. Silverman, Dr. Sedano, James, and Joanne for this informative presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available by email in the next few days. Thank you again for joining us. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics and KBMO, stay healthy, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness. Thank you, everyone. That was wonderful. Great. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.